One of the perks about having a mediumly popular YouTube channel on renewable energy technologies is that I get contacted by a lot of inventors who tell me that they have come up with a way to get free energy via some sort of complicated mechanism. In fact, I get so many of these that I made a whole video on the laws of thermodynamics and why perpetual motion or free energy isn't a thing. And that just led to a flood of people contacting me to tell me that they had found a way to beat the laws of thermodynamics. And do I want to invest in it or maybe promote it on my channel? So yeah, those are annoying, but maybe in response to them, I kind of love engineering projects that look like perpetual motion machines, but actually aren't. One example is a video I made explaining Veritasium's video on Rick Cavallaro's downwind faster than the wind device. It takes most people, including me, quite a while to get their head around the idea that it works within the rules of physics, not by creating free energy and not by some kind of scam. And today's video is another in that vein. It's a mining train that's purely gravity powered. It doesn't use diesel, it's not solar or wind powered or any other kind of renewable energy. It simply charges its batteries when it's traveling downhill and then uses that charge to get itself back uphill to where it started. How is that not a perpetual motion machine? In this video, I'll be answering that question, talking about how it uses gravitational potential energy and regenerative braking to make this round trip without violating the laws of thermodynamics. And I'll also talk about other similar projects and how much this technology can scale to help decarbonize transport and mining globally. I'm Rosie Barnes. Welcome to Engineering with Rosie. Let's go back to this gravity power train. What's going on there? It's a project that was announced by Fortescue Metal Group earlier this year in partnership with Williams Advanced Engineering. And that's Williams of F1 fame, who FMG acquired. And they've given this project a very catchy but pretty much ungoogleable name, Infinity Train. It's a train that will take iron ore from their mine in the Pilbara in Western Australia to the port. According to their press release, their regenerating battery electric iron ore train project will use gravitational energy to fully recharge its battery electric systems without any additional charging requirements for the return trip to reload. The idea is that the train will travel downhill from the mine to the port carrying the payload and generate and store energy in onboard batteries on its way downhill. And then because the cars are lighter on the way back up to the mine after they drop off all their iron ore at the port, they'll need less energy for the return trip than if they were full. So they can power the whole return journey with the energy they stored on the way down. This is really similar to a simple system that's been used in mining sites since the 1600s. Ropeways like this one that Tom Scott visited for a video last year can be used to transfer products from a mine to a nearby and lower location without any additional energy input. Loaded cars glide down a zip line, which pulls a corresponding empty car going back up. The Infinity is a similar idea, but since the Fortescue mine is a little bigger and a lot further from the port, the required zip line would have to be hundreds of kilometers long and thick enough to pull tens of thousands of tons. So obviously they're not doing that. Instead of using a ropeway, the Infinity train stores energy on board instead. Like the old timey ropeways, the Infinity train converts gravitational potential energy that's stored in the mass of the iron ore sitting at some height above sea level into kinetic energy of the moving train but then the difference to the ropeway is that in the infinity train, regenerative braking converts that kinetic energy into chemical energy that's stored in batteries on the train. You may have first-hand experience of regenerative braking if you drive an electric vehicle, or in fact, if you travel a lot on electric or diesel electric trains, which commonly use the technology these days. The way it works is that during braking, the electric motor actually runs in reverse. So instead of using electricity to turn the motor and drive the wheels, the wheels turn the motor and the motor now acts as a generator. The resistance from this slows the car or train and the electricity can be used to charge a battery. To power the train back up to the mine, the electric motor runs in its normal direction, powered by the battery. And as it regains elevation, some of the battery stored energy is converted to gravitational potential energy. The interesting thing about this project is not really the regenerative braking, that's pretty much old news. It's been very common in passenger trains, especially for at least a decade. But those trains all need to be charged from an external energy source, whereas the infinity train does not. Regenerative braking on normal trains can yield energy savings of about 8 to 17% and even higher in very dense suburban networks that do a lot of full stops and starts. But for the Infinity train, it's a 100% saving, which is only possible because of the specific nature of the train and its route. The train itself makes a round trip from the mine to the port and back again, but its load only makes a one-way trip, strictly downhill only. And that's the reason why it's not a perpetual motion device. The gravitational potential energy the load held when I was at the mine doesn't need to be recovered as the train returns from the port. That energy can be converted to power the train back up the hill. 
Energy is conserved. There's no free energy needed. The big advantage of this is that they won't need to buy any diesel. And considering that Fortescue's rail operations used 82 million litres of diesel in 2021, even if that was only $1 a litre, that means they're currently spending $82 million per year in diesel. And because they won't ever have to charge the batteries externally, they don't need to buy electricity and they don't need to install any charging infrastructure. Now, I couldn't find out how much of that 82 million litres will be eliminated by specifically by the Infinity Train project. And Fortescue have only mentioned project development costs of 50 million. They haven't said what the capital cost to actually modify the trains is. So it's not really possible to get an idea of the financial payback they can expect from the Infinity Train project. Though, I mean, I expect that will turn out to save them money, at least in the long run. And in the medium term, it will be part of their announced commitment to be net zero in scope one and two emissions by 2030. Part of that is a commitment to get off diesel entirely within the next eight years. If you're a longtime viewer of Engineering with Rosie, you might have seen a few of my other videos on energy technologies that involve conversions of gravitational potential energy. It's kind of a theme for me these days. This includes pumped hydro and other kinds of gravity energy storage. And I've mentioned before that one of the reasons that I love making videos about this kind of thing is that the basic Physics behind it is so simple, and that means that it's easy to check the claims of new technologies. So let's do that now. The Infinity train weighs 40,000 tons empty and can carry 34,400 tons of iron ore. It takes that 34,400 tons of iron ore from Cloudbreak Mine at 450 meters above sea level to Port Hedland, 280 kilometers away, and it completes the trip in about five hours. The equation to calculate gravitational potential energy is simply mass times gravity times height. So when it starts its trip down, fully loaded, it has 326 gigajoules of gravitational potential energy, which is about 91 megawatt hours. And of course, when it's at the port, it has no gravitational potential energy as it's at sea level. To get the empty train back up to the mine, it will need to regain 176 gigajoules or 49 megawatt hours of gravitational potential energy, which needs to come from the batteries. 176 divided by 326 equals 54%. So the regenerative braking system needs to be able to convert at least 54% of the kinetic energy gain going down into usable energy. And this definitely seems plausible to me because I know that regenerative braking systems on cars can achieve much more than that. However, this is not taking into account losses from things like rail friction, aerodynamic drag, mechanical efficiencies, etc., which would result in a higher energy requirement for the train to climb back up and a lower energy recovery going down. So let's just add in very rough estimates for those losses. We'll assume that running resistance accounts for 37% of energy consumption. I got that figure from the low end of a published study on passenger trains in Japan. I use the low end because I assume a mining train moves pretty slowly and it doesn't stop and start much compared to a passenger train. And in fact, 37% may well be too high. The train needs 49 megawatt hours to climb without losses. So with losses included, it will need 78 megawatt hours in total, which is still less than the 91 megawatt hours we have to work with from the gravitational potential energy at the mine. But we're going to need to convert it with 85% efficiency, which is pretty high. Remember, though, that I've used a lot of estimates and also some basically wild guesses at some of the numbers here. So it could be 10 or 20% less than that. It wouldn't surprise me. Fortescue's CEO, Elizabeth Gaines, does mention that the Infinity Train has the capacity to be the world's most efficient battery electric locomotive. And I mean, perhaps it will have to be. But certainly the numbers don't suggest that the project is physically impossible. So the physics makes sense, at least at the back of an envelope level of accuracy. It doesn't appear to rely on any kind of free energy or perpetual motion. But there does remain one big practical issue, energy storage. Each trip would require an energy storage system capable of storing somewhat less than 90 megawatt hours of energy per train. A three megawatt hour Tesla mega pack weighs about 23 tons and it's the size of a shipping container. So if we have 30 of those, it's an extra 690 tons that needs to be added to the train's weight. And that needs to be carried uphill as well as downhill, which means we'll actually need more energy storage and therefore more battery mass. So, you know, we really ought to go back and iterate our calculations to account for this. But 690 tons, it's only about 2% of the train's empty weight. So I, I think it's okay to leave it there. To me, it clearly makes sense for Fortescue to do it, probably purely for financial reasons. And plus, you know, it's part of their target to decarbonize mining operations by 2030. Fortescue's diesel consumption represents 11% of their scope one emissions. So projects like this will help them to reduce that. But can we roll this out on a large scale? Is this going to help us reduce emissions from mining in a meaningful way? Probably not. Uh, this is a super specific project that only just works out, at least according to my rough calculations. This project wouldn't work if the load had to travel uphill or even if it was just level from the mine to its destination. And it wouldn't work if the running resistance was any higher because, say, it wasn't a low friction train, but instead a truck. 
And in fact, there is actually a mining track that is pretty similar in concept to the Infinity Train. It's called the E-Dumper. It was developed by a Swiss company, Kunschweiz AG. They converted a diesel mining dump truck to what they're calling the world's largest electric vehicle. Though I'm not sure what they count as an electric vehicle. I mean, I know that there are plenty of electric trains and electric ferries in the world that I would call electric vehicles, and I would expect that they are bigger than this mining truck. So I'd rather call the E-Dumper the world's largest electric truck rather than the world's largest electric vehicle, but that's just being pedantic. It weighs 100 tons when fully loaded and has a 600 kilowatt hour battery with regenerative braking that recovers energy as it drives downhill, carrying a load of rocks. It then travels back uphill using that energy. But in most cases, it's not 100% self-sufficient. So for some reason, Formula E driver Lucas Degrassi had a go in it. And he said, uh, we went out of here with 90%. We went all the way to the top. We arrived with 80% battery loaded up. And on our way back, we recovered 8%. So we came back with 88%. That's actually pretty cool. And I agree, Lucas, that's pretty cool. And it apparently saves 50,000 tons of fuel per vehicle per year, which is Definitely cool. But if you are losing 2% charge each round trip, it's not 100% gravity powered like the Infinity Train is going to be. So not quite as catchy. And the gradient needs to be much steeper for it to work than in the low friction Infinity Train example. The manufacturer suggests with about a 10% gradient, it won't ever need to be charged. So that would limit it to pretty short, steep routes. On long routes, you'd need a bigger battery. And the battery in the E-Dumper is already nearly 5% of the unloaded truck's mass. On less steep routes, the ratio of gravitational potential energy to friction losses would skew in favor of friction, so you need top-up charging. So whilst regenerative braking is a great technology that makes EVs of all kinds much more efficient, I don't think we'll be able to do away with charging altogether in any more than a few niche cases. The calculations I've done in this video are all based on really simple physics. If you want to see what the effect of more accurate or different assumptions are, then it's very easy for you to do that. And if you need more help to get comfortable with the physics, then Brilliant can help you out. They're the sponsor of this video. Brilliant is a website and app with over 60 interactive courses in math, science, and related topics like engineering. They have interactive courses on all the basic physics principles that I use today. And if you want to dig deeper into some of the factors that I only guessed at, like say if you want to know how to estimate the aerodynamic drag, the course for that was one I particularly liked because it uses the example of a downhill skier. The interactivity and everyday examples are some of the best things about Brilliant. You learn by doing, not just memorizing, and then you apply the concepts to familiar examples. This helps you develop an intuitive understanding of how the world works. You can get started on Brilliant for free. And for Engineering with Rosie viewers, Brilliant is offering 20% off an annual subscription for the first 200 viewers to sign up. You just need to go to brilliant.org slash engineering with Rosie, and I'll put the link in the description. So a big thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. And thanks also to everyone in the Engineering with Rosie Patreon team who, you know, they sponsor every video that I do. If you want to join us and support the channel, have input on the future direction and access our Patreon only Discord server, then you can join us at this link. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.